as, as a starting point, um, I think Martin sort of mentioned it. You're in a fabulous position, I might say, because you are not encumbered by all of the um, couple of centuries of, in some instances, 300 years, and St. Thomas's is probably about 900 years. You know, they, those actually generate some quite significant challenges when you're going to really bring uh, entities together. And let's be very honest, partnerships are not easy. You're, at, you're, in the, you're in the relatively honeymoon phase, all right? Uh, they're not easy, and of course they get harder as you get into the real detail, and I think as one or two of you recognize, it, it gets even harder when you get down to the money. Um, and that's just not gonna get any easier in the next short period of time. So, you know, being very clear about the purpose uh, of your uh, desire to work in partnership, very clear about the objectives that you're setting out, both near term, medium term, and, and beyond that, the other crucial thing, of course, is to really be certain that the, the, you know, the, the, the senior members of the individual partners are completely wedded to this. And again, this is all fine when you're mapping it out, but when difficult decisions have to be taken, then everybody's got to be uh, aligned. Um, and I, I'm, going to, I'm going to walk you through probably it's a bit of a showcase of some of the stuff that we have in our partnership. Uh, and I'm not doing that because I'm suggesting these are the things you need to necessarily aspire for. Martin is absolutely right. Key to this is con considering and being very, very overt about what it is that's different, distinctive, if potentially even unique about the partnership that you're generating. Um, but I'll just walk you through some of the profile. Uh, it's a, not often I get a chance to show some of the things, some of the assets that we have. So, um, But just to orientate you, we have a major challenge. So, of course, we have the benefit of being in central London, but that, of course, comes with some very significant challenges. We're distributed. You might argue, well, you're only a few hundred metres away from each other, you know, just getting across these various sites can and often is uh, somewhat challenging. Um, we are part of a multi-faculty university. We're doing our partnership in this context as a single university working with our NHS partners. I've worked in other environments where we've had multiple universities and you can get that to work. Of course, it's not without its challenges. But just, you know, so we're big, and health uh, in Kings is well over half of that. We are comprehensive, and that's something that perhaps we might reflect a bit more on uh, in discussion. Comprehensive in our training across health. Um, and so the things we're seeking to do within our partnership are relevant across the whole spectrum of those engaged in health care. And we have a major focus, not perhaps too surprisingly, given our depth of uh, basic science, uh, pretty heavily on some elements of discovery and taking that into the pipeline. And that we've enriched uh, in recent years in partnership with the Francis Crick Institute up at, uh, on the Euston Road. Uh, and I'll illustrate some elements of that. We're old, which is why we have some Nobel Prize winners. Uh, the, the most recent of those is at least 60 years ago. So just, you know, put it all in perspective. Martin, I think, has already emphasized the point I was going to make. We're a multi-faculty university. The partnership brings many other dimensions than the traditional sort of biomedical science model. And those are going to be and are absolutely essential in driving uh, the elements of uh, the partnership that I'm sure uh, you're keen to uh, uh, deliver. And I've just highlighted here some of the ones that we draw upon. Um, I, strangely enough, have left out social sciences, which I suspect is, is going to be even more relevant. We, we established um, our Academic Health Science Centre, as Martin indicated, in the first wave uh, of these. Um, so we've now been running for uh, over 13 years. Um, so you'd like to think that that means we're very established. Uh, what, what it really means is that we know where um, all of the potential risks uh, sit, uh, and, and they're real. Um, uh, and I've already alluded to the fact that we're distributed. 
And one of the ways in which we tr sought to try and manage that in a more effective way and use the, the partnership to start perhaps asking how do we deal with some of the duplication I think Scott was referring to, or indeed even triplication of uh, not only uh, uh, resources, uh, facilities, but actually also thinking about uh, service alignment and streamlining that. We have two very big acute trusts, St. Guides and St. Thomas's and KCH. And of course, unusually, we have this exceptionally large mental health trust uh, and its associated academic components. So they are distributed, the St. Thomas's uh, uh, campus, as I'll illustrate to you, has now become a major, a major location for our med tech activity, including imaging. On, on the Denmark Hill site, well, that's where uh, the uh, uh, South London and Morsey and the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neurosciences, and uh, uh, notwithstanding other activities in the acute hospital and hematology, uh, liver transplantation being amongst those, Denmark Hill has become, if you like, our neuroscience hub but that leaves us with the guys campus and um, uh, where we really have developed most of our biotech and biomedical uh, operations. To give you a sense of the scale, uh, the, the overall turnover within the partnership is financially pretty considerable and staffing is uh, indeed very, very substantial. You, you've already alluded to it. How do you bring all of those staff into the partnership and make them feel as though they are party? to it. Uh, I'll illustrate a couple of things that we have done, but of course maintaining that level of engagement is uh, uh, not without its challenges. A huge patient level of contact, particularly in the acute uh, context, um, and, and of course that now has driven a very large uh, research income base, and I've already alluded to the very significant educational opportunities. So. Just trying to put this into what I described as a, as a pipeline, I think we're familiar with this no notion. Just uh, wanted to, you, you, you've alluded to it, Th this is pretty challenging stuff, you know. Um, I am struck, I hope you don't mind me saying this, I, you know, just looking out with this audience here, your, your demographic's very different to the one that uh, I would be talking to if this was in Denmark Hill, uh, or indeed even uh, 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 at Guy's or St. Thomas's. There's a real opportunity for you there. Of course, we seek to take rather different strategies to reach into communities who, for many, many reasons, uh, feel quite un unsure, uncertain, and in fact, uh, very insecure about engagement in research in general, in including health-related uh, research. So lots of different instruments are required there's no one simple me mechanism. We have, as I've already alluded to, a very strong focus around our early discovery, but of course ensuring those discoveries can be then taken up requires a very significant machinery to ensure that the cogs do keep turning. And of course our biomedical research centers have been crucial in that. Uh, CRFs, our clinical research facilities, we have facilities on all three of those hub sites. Uh, in fact, we have in total uh, six CRFs uh, to manage, uh, including our, our pediatric uh, children's health um, CRFs. We've put a big, big focus, and I'll try and just spend a moment on, on the informatics piece, and this is our clinical uh, translational informatics center that sits within this. And I'm glad Martin mentioned something of industry and the commercial piece. I, I'll reflect on that. That is, you know, it's not easy. Again, it's a journey you have to kind of get onto. Of course, demonstrating that commercial entities, if they want to put work with you, have effectively access across the partnership makes you so much more compelling in your efforts to engage with them. Uh, and we've uh, now been pretty successful in seeing at least some components both in terms of developing our own uh, activities and spin-outs as well as bringing commercial partners in. And then I, I, I actually, so, so I think, and I've, I'll illustrate this, the bit where I think you're going to do far better than us, and you're already ahead of us, is ensuring that you are engaged more broadly across your system and in particular with your integrated care system, where uh, I think it is fair to say 
uh, we uh, are buffered, we're buffering around how to dock in effectively uh, to ours. So uh, you know, you're, you're in a very strong position to make maximum uh, opportunity from that and we are going to need to put an awful lot more effort into it. So let me just um, walk you through a few, a few of the things. Gaining that cultural alignment really, you know, it sounds as though you're making exceptionally good progress in relation to the reasons and purposes of focusing on education, training and research within the tripartite mission and its relevance to clinical excellence. And of course, the problem, I mean, it's a lovely flow of words, but it is not, uh, of course, easy when each of the partner organizations is increasingly financially challenged and all of those things do not in any way add to the, your margin. They, of course, detract from it. But the benefits, of course, are there, and you've alluded to some of those. But driving that cultural alignment, uh, and it it, it's a persistent and constant. You have to keep on refreshing all of the efforts. And that's partly because, of course, leadership comes and goes. Leadership is crucial in all of this. Uh, and you have to you know, be mindful as new people come in, you need to bring them with you on the journey. We, to try and capture uh, everybody who is in the partnership, we, at the early stages, decided we would form uh, a whole series of clinical academic groups, so effectively academic and clinical partners, so those who are in the NHS uh, and those in uh, aligned and relevant areas within the university, forming cl uh, clinical academic groups across the whole spectrum. And that meant that we have a number of cl uh, clinical academic groups where, where there may neither be, um, either there may not be academic excellence, but there may be elements of clinical excellence, and vice versa. And then, of course, in a small number, we ha I have identified uh, where we really do believe we've got um, evidence of both academic excellence, clinical excellence, and we want to really enhance those, and a, a few of them are illustrated here. Physical proximity, I, I've illustrated that we are dispersed in the those hubs, but within those hubs, we are advantaged in having real proximity across the, proximity, uh, the partners. That is perhaps the one benefit of our historic nature. So we have grown up embedded within our, uh, uh, our traditional hospitals. That is a benefit in uh, the individual sites. It, of course, means that you have to work very closely on ensuring you're using those assets, those uh, uh, estate assets maximally. Getting, getting to um, this bit, and I think this is the, the, the phase you're at, it's pretty easy to map out where you have individual strengths, and as has been described, each of our partners, they have their own strategies. It, it's really ensuring you've got alignment around key, if you like, platforms or cross-cutting areas or notable peaks where, by working in partnership, you're going to drive and add value to the partners. That's the key. And reaching a consensus around those uh, is, is important to spend the necessary time. I've highlighted here some of the obvious ones. Well, our strengths in mental health are, uh, are, are well.
engaged, but their substantive contract is within the trust. But they want and need to be able to access the totality of the university's resources, and, but don't want a clinical academic contract for a wide variety of reasons. And so the development of an adjunct appointment where they sit within a portal of the university, typically within our health faculties, has become a, a very useful tool. Uh, they have to demonstrate their commitment, and usually, of course, it's because they're holding either uh, a relatively significant grant or are making very significant contributions to research. Of course, uh, the key benefit that accrues, and one of the things that we, again, have placed an awful lot of emphasis on, is, is colleagues who are in that sort of position, or more widely making educational uh, and research contributions, we, we have a very clear mechanism by which they can be recognized in academic promotions in an honorary program uh, that we hold. And we have a very significant number of our uh, senior leaders in, in the partnership who hold honorary professorships uh, within King's against pretty clear metrics by which those are delivered. But those, of course, uh, I think are relatively easy things to focus on. Uh, they, they do require work to ensure that they're being appropriately delivered. <clears throat> I'm very pleased that we've talked already an awful lot about training. Um, and I, I worry less about trying to define ECRs. I'm actually pretty keen sometimes being described as an ECR myself, but because um, I'm still learning. Uh, and, uh, but, but the reality is, it's a really difficult journey. I mean, if you know, Malcolm and I sit around the med schools council, uh, and I, I get really anxious that we're really going to struggle over the next period of time to see people wanting to come into this track. I mean, you've got, to be a, you've got to be off your head. Just think about it. You're going to get asked to be submitted into a ref to demonstrate that you're internationally uh, uh, leading, um, pull in your grants, deliver your education, and still be uh, clinically excellent uh, or in whichever realm you're in. These are really tough things to do. And by the way, you'll get no support uh, uh, on the journey. Uh, so, so, you know, it, you are absolutely right to put huge amounts of emphasis. You will not regret any of the time and effort. And you want to make sure you're bringing your broader community, and particularly, of course, your more senior members of community, to really support you and focus on this. We've only just set up this concept of a clinical academic training office. It, it really probably should be called a health academic training office because it's not just the medical realm. We have, of course, a big focus on our nursing allied health professionals. We haven't really talked an awful lot about that this morning yet, um, but they are crucial to the endeavor, at least as crucial and potentially more so than, if you like, your medical uh, professions. So the clinical academic training office is just as, uh, uh, as Nikki was describing, it's virtual and it, it's the signposting, it's the hand-holding, uh, and it's the broader uh, general support of which we have now developed quite a mature system of doing all the things that have been described, particularly as folk are going either through the IAT program, but we have multiple uh, other doctoral training centers across the realm, uh, some, for example, the British Heart Foundation Center, a Wellcome Trust, several Wellcome Trust programs. They all can and are accessible through the Clinical Academic Training Office. We have three um, uh, 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 directors. There's a lead director who actually is a medic. We have uh, a nurse who's a co-director uh, and one of our colleagues out of, out of mental health. Um, and they are developing and have developed a whole suite of support packages. But actually, of course, the other thing is doing that mapping, mapping who is where on the journey uh, and developing the networks. So this is, this is actually, relatively speaking, low cost in terms of the, the substrate, the infrastructure for it. it. It is, of course, a cost in terms of people's time and willingness to engage. But I can only say again, this is by far and away the quickest way of moving forward uh, by putting the emphasis on, on these folk. We have a big IAT program. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it, those have been incredibly helpful, but they're not without their uh, challenges. And if I were to be very frank, 
we have had more success in bringing uh, the totality of our clinical academic community through non-IAT programs. I wouldn't shout this too loudly. Uh, NIHR. Uh, it, it, the big fall-off point here is in the ACLs um, because if they don't find a route through to a further fellowship uh, towards the end of their, um, uh, their lectureship, uh, then a, a, a full-time NHS post just looks incredibly attractive. Uh, and it's very difficult, of course, for them to feel the confidence to be bridged uh, as they're seeking a support. We, we're seeking to address that in part through, through the, uh, uh, clin the Clinical Academic Training Office. We start early. Uh, we have a good foundation program. And, of course, within uh, all of our undergrad programs across all of the uh, health realms, uh, we place a very significant focus on the opportunities that the partnership offers beyond just their immediate undergrad training. And then the partnership also has developed a whole suite uh, of educational programs in the sort of postgrad uh, or indeed just uh, professional uh, level. Let me just quickly show you some of the infrastructure. Uh, don't get too worried about the, the notion you've got to build all of this immediately. This has taken us the best part of 20 years. Uh, to do. So the tower, this is at Guy's. Actually, this was built as a hospital building. Um, uh, 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 had only just opened when I went to Guy's as a medical student. But over the last 20, or well, certainly 15 years, we have converted much of this into what I think one would have to probably describe as one of the best experimental m uh, medicine facilities to support the breadth of early uh, studies in humans. Uh, and, of course, most of those are in patients. So a whole raft of facilities uh, in there. Of course, one of them is rather important, as we do have an ICU uh, in there as well, so that we can engage in some of those advanced therapy studies. So, and, and a number of programs uh, of which, of course, uh, we often find ourselves using the notion that we host an activity that then is a network beyond, either a network in London or a network for the, uh, the nation and a good example of the advanced therapies, uh, but we actually host the Innovate UK um, gene and cell therapy catapult. That's not ours, we host it, it's buried uh, uh, on the 10th floor of the tower, uh, but it does mean that we uh, can use that as an attractant for folk to come at least to the campus and then develop ideas with us. I just want, just again to reflect our, our approach, just a few of the big um, companies that we have substantial uh, partnership arrangements with. And the model that we've adopted here, so the, 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 each of these that are listed here, um, these big pharma companies, have groups that are embedded with us, typically in these facilities. So they're not, you know, the whole R&D effort is not on our campus at the present time, but they have research groups working alongside our folk within these experimental medicine facilities. And then alongside that, and this has taken us a good while to really get some momentum behind, but we now are seeing uh, our own uh, academics spinning out companies, and in the last few years we've had a, a raft of incredibly successful ones. And of course that becomes self-fulfilling, because if you can see, and as if you're an earlier stage of your own career, and you can see this line of sight of being able to take your idea all the way through uh, the journey of spinning out and then successful company formation, uh, that actually becomes really helpful role models. Um, I'll show a picture at the very end of uh, one other thing that I don't think we've mentioned uh, as yet, but displaying the activities that you're engaged in to the public is a really great opportunity to engage with the public. And, and so we've thought a bit about that. Uh, very quickly, now moving over to St. Thomas's, lots of activity. That's one of our busiest acute sites, of course. Um, but here we put in a whole bunch of things in the engineering sphere. Again, a huge amount of investment, and uh, you know, that's needed the university, the trust, uh, and us to work, of course, with uh, the other external funders. Uh, uh, Research England have helped with the building that uh, is illustrated here. That's going to be complete. Uh, that will bring companies into that location will run a whole series of programs alongside it and allow us to start companies up, uh, either our own or those that are being nurtured uh, in this space 
uh, nearby. Um, we, we've also, uh, in partnership with the Trust, and this has required huge amounts of effort, developed a, an incredible farm for uh, imaging. And we've got pretty, pretty much the state of the art. Uh, and that has allowed us to work with the companies in co-designing, co-developing, and now, of course, iterating uh, their, their next generation of scanners, etc. So then just zipping down to Denmark Hill, they always like me to start with this. They think they're pretty good, actually, um, and I suppose they're, they're not bad. Um, and, and they have, uh, across the whole range, neuroscience. This was actually interesting. This is one thing in the partnership that we, we hadn't done. So those of you who know anything of the history, uh, the Institute of Psychiatry has been around for you know, a long time, certainly at least 80 years. It was an independent postgraduate medical, uh, postgraduate center until the university, the med school started amalgamating in London. They worked so hard to retain their independence even once they became part of King's. It was a real battle to get them engaged at all. And then as the partnership started to align itself more, two things happened. Well, one, we didn't do psychology, and so there was an opportunity to bring psychology in, which seems a bit odd that we didn't, but we didn't. And now that's an incredibly successful program, both at undergrad and postgrad level. And then we thought, in a, in a moment of complete madness, what about putting neuroscience alongside psychiatry? Wouldn't that be interesting? And it has, of course, worked incredibly well in driving completely new and different ideas. And we needed to create some facilities and we got some help. Uh, actually, I, I hope we will get a chance to just think uh, th this, this building carries a name. Philanthropy is incredibly important in this space. And we've been helped on a number of occasions. We don't do it as well as we could do, I think, and I certainly don't think we do it as well as we're going to need to, and I think that's something you'll do well to spend some time uh, certainly mapping out how across the partnership and how you can work in partnership in driving your asset uh, to make yourselves rather more attractive in, in the philanthropic space. Just a few other of the uh, programs that sit within that, and actually how that has driven a number of really remarkable new uh, discoveries all the way through to therapies, and Peter Goadsby, who's one of our investigators, has uh, just got the brain prize for having really taken a therapy right away from basic discovery into the clinic and now is uh, in, in uh, clinical use. And it allows you to be pretty imaginative. So this is on the, um, uh, the, the site, the uh, South London and Maudsley site. This building, this is the, the, the uh, artist illustration of it, but it's actually very nearly uh, up to this level now as a, as a structure. So this is fully funded and is in play. There is nowhere else that has what it, that this building is, and that's uh, an integrated clinical, um, res clinical service delivery, research facility, uh, focused entirely on children and young people's mental health. Uh, and you can see it's had some interesting design considerations. There's a school uh, wrapped into that uh, as well. So that uh, it, it will open up completely new opportunities across the partnership. It sits within the Mental Health Trust. Of course, this idea we put in play before the pandemic, and gosh, uh, we're going to need it now that we're in the place we are uh, right now. We talked a bit about data. Um, uh, this is, again, just illustrating some of the broader partnerships that are uh, uh, relevant here. One of the challenges, and I hope you're going to be able to navigate through this, everybody gets themselves very locked down in, you know, there is value in data. Well, there is certainly massive opportunity in this harnessing the power of data. But if you obsess about the value of the data, you will find the partners do not uh, fi find it easy or indeed an easy way to allow anybody access to the individual data sets. And you want to bring completely different sort of thinking to addressing uh, aggregated data. And there are multiple mechanisms, as we all know, of doing that in federated forms. Uh, but, it, you know, that's worth spending quite a bit of time in ensuring that people can see the benefits of allowing multiple partners to engage in some of these activities. I should have put on here, and Martin reminded me of this when he was speaking, the other data element that I think we did make some contribution to during the pandemic was um, the Zoe app. 
I wonder if anybody would like, uh, how many of you are Zoe app contributors? Well, that's not bad. Uh, uh, actually, if, if you were standing where I'm standing, you'd see that there is a specific demographic. It's a gender bias. Um, uh, I talked to Tim, Tim Spector about that, but it, anyway. Uh, uh, but, you know, that, that was a real moment in time. Aggregated over four million people during the pandemic, putting their data in on a daily basis in many instances, and some of you may, uh, perhaps many of you are, still contributing data uh, to it. So a complete mindset change as to how you could draw data uh, uh, in real time. Um, and so there are enormous opportunities. I'm just going to put a flag, uh, actually, for a program uh, I'm still engaged in, which is something you might also, and I haven't heard you mention. So in all of this, we talk about patient engagement. Actually, the opportunity is to shift, as, I, as we all know, to moving away from thinking about patients who, of course, at very late stages of their disease uh, uh, course, and where interventions are of limited value. Of course, the opportunity that we want to utilize now is how do we get to much earlier stages of uh, disease recognition, and indeed even identifying those at uh, different levels of risk, and indeed the potential for early interventions or, indeed, uh, or, or, or possibly prevention. Um, we have uh, a, a program uh, I set up whilst I was over at Barts in the London, Queen Mary, Genes and Health, uh, we've got 60,000 people, not patients, they may or may not be patients in any of the uh, hospitals in that area, who are engaged in an ongoing, real-time, population-scale genomics program. So we have DNA, they've consented to provision of DNA, we have full sequencing on them. They consent to linkage to their primary and secondary and tertiary healthcare record in real-time. Uh, they consent to us working in partnership, including commercial partners, uh, on, those, on that data set. And finally, they consent to at least approaching them to recall for more detailed uh, uh, assessment and analysis. Of course, they retain freedom as to whether they wish to be recalled or not. That partnership, 60,000, these are uh, individuals primarily of Bangladeshi and Pakistani heritage population who are otherwise massively underrepresented in uh, all of the global genome efforts uh, and indeed historically massively underrepresented in all of our research clinical trial recruitment efforts. And that diversity is a key factor in one of the ways in which NIHR of course have got to make sure as they move to other and broader programs and this could and might be seen as a flagship for the this massive population genomics program, the, our, our future health, of which I'm sure many of you are aware. But just to say, that program, and it's partly because some of the features of the, of the um, uh, population, including a much higher rate of um, close parental relatedness, the term they, they like us to use, that we have now an industry consortium funding uh, that program at the level of 30 million pounds to support the ongoing effort. So that does two things. It brings a massive level of population engagement, really allows a, a, a whole sway of uh, clinical and academic colleagues to engage in the data set, and of course is a portal by which you can also uh, uh, engage industry. So uh, I, I think I've said enough about the partners here. Last couple of slides, if I may. So. Uh, at, what, how can you measure success here? Well, ultimately, of course, success is patient benefit. And those actually are metrics that are still quite tricky to really anchor. Um, and, of course, they get compounded by issues to do with social determinants of health as much as the interventions that we're talking about uh, here. But one of the things that we are also keen to do is to draw the population into this uh, whole uh, opportunity, but allow our investigators to work uh, much more in that innovation uh, and potentially commercialization space. And so most recently we've launched this entity, uh, which is an innovation district, we call it SC1, that's a fictitious postcode, it doesn't exist, 
south central one, I guess, captures it. And, and two things that that does that we didn't have in our partnership. Um, we are uh, fortunate, I think it is fair to say, to have one of the largest and, and oldest um, hospital-based charities, although they are now very focused on their own urban uh, 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 charity ac activities. Although they retain the name Guy's and St. Thomas's, they are very independent of both the hospitals and the university, but they are focused on this area. Um, so that's a pretty helpful asset because they, they, they have quite a bit of freehold uh, in the region. But this has also allowed us to truly engage with our local boroughs, Lambeth and Southwark in our case, in a way that's somewhat separate to the activities of the integrated care system, where they, of course, are very keen to see through innovation, wealth creation in, in the region. Um, and so that's, that's an innovation that we've just launched, and I mentioned it earlier, but just to finish with creating a, a window in which the population can, can capture uh, some of this. And uh, we've been fortunate, again, to recently uh, develop some of our older estate. This is on the Guy's campus. But the reason, of course, that was a good place to do is, if you, as I'm sure many of you do, go up to London via London Bridge, uh, you know, huge footfall of people coming through. Uh, and, and we've managed to capture some of that uh, through the science gallery that we've created. I'm going to pause and stop there, if, if I may, and look forward to some of the discussion we're going to have. <laughs>